Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Julie Angster Melnick with Medical and Scientific Affairs at Roche Diagnostic Corporation. So on April 25th, 2014, the Roche Cobus HPV test received FDA approval as a first line primary screening test for cervical cancer. Um, and so what this talk or what I'm here to present is just some data around uh, the COBOX test for primary screening um, and provide a little bit of background um, around this, this new indication. I will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, so feel free to uh, write them down as, as they come to your mind. Um, and with that, welcome. So the concept of utilizing exfoliated cytology to identify women with invasive cervical cancer was first introduced, introduced by Papa Nicolau and Babes in the 1920s. But it wasn't until the 1950s, following refinement of the technique, that it was demonstrated that conventional cytology could also be used to identify precancerous lesions of the cervix and had the potential to actually prevent the development of cervical cervical cancer. This technique is still in use today and in fact is the most common method used in the United States and also abroad. In 1975, ACOG published the first US-wide recommendations for annual pap testing for women 18 years and older as a means to screen for cervical cancer. And it wasn't until the late 18, 1980s that the link between HPV and cervical cancer was established, and not until 1995 where the International Agency for Research of Cancer actually classified HPV 16 and 18 as carcinogenic and concluded that HPV infection is a necessary cause of cervical cancer. Following that, um, in 1999, we saw the first FDA-approved HPV test and since then, we've seen that cervical cancer guidelines or cervical cancer screening guidelines continue to have evolved to provide data-driven recommendations that highlight the preferred method of screening inc that includes HPV testing. And since the widespread adoption um, following the 1975 ACOG recommendations, it did allow for a quick and early reduction in cervical cancer incidence and mortality. But despite the, the launch of the first FDA approved test in 1999 and the increasingly stronger recommendations around the utilization of HPV testing and cervical cancer screening, adoption remains fairly low even today. And this has led to a leveling off on the incidence of cervical cancer in the last decade, as there are several limitations that still exist by using a cytology-based screening method. So one of the main uh, limitations around a cytology-based screening uh, program for the detection of cervical cancer um, is that Cytology is very subjective, and this leads to intra and interlaboratory variability. As part of the ALTS trial, the National Cancer Institute had about 5,000 cytology slides reread by second cytopathologists. Um, here you can see the results of, of that uh, analysis. And on the left side of this table, you see what the original diagnosis was. And along the top, you see what the second reviewer's diagnosis was. Um, what we do see is that about 78% of the known cytology was reclassified as known by the second cytopathologist. Not surprising, about 43% of the original ASCIS calls were confirmed as ASCIS, which really highlights the fact that this still is a very equivocal uh, cytological uh, grade. But what was surprising is that 47% of the H cell cases were reclassified as H, as H cell upon review. 
And again, this really highlights the fact that cytology is not very reproduci reproducible. In addition, from the Athena study, here are the four labs that performed uh, cytology uh, readings. These four labs represent the labs that perform about 25% of all cytology in the United States today. Along these four labs, what we see is that the median age for the women included in the study did not change from lab to lab. And the age of a woman is really what dictates or is one of their uh, main uh, factors in abnormal cytology readings. So despite the similar median age, what we see is that this ASCIS rate or the abnormal rates for PAPs actually varied quite dramatically between the four labs, from a low of about 3.8% abnormal calls to a high of about 9.9%. What we also saw is that because of this range in abnormalities, the sensitivity of cytology also varied from 42% to 73%. And that's not surprising considering the higher the abnormal calls, the more likely disease will be detected upon uh, uh, colposcopy. And so the higher sensitivity of cytology is related to the higher rate of abnormal calls. Again, highlighting the subjectivity of, of cytology. Across these four labs, what we also saw is that the sensitivity of the Cobox HPV test did not vary uh, tr tremendously. We also know that cytology has a very limited sensitivity for CIN2 or greater lesions. So here are two audits, one performed at Kaiser Permanente and one in Sweden. And in these studies, there was an analysis looking at uh, women diagnosed with invasive cervical carcinomas. And what the audit aimed to do was to look at what their recent uh, screening histories were of these women. Not surprisingly, about 60% of women that had invasive cervical carcinoma had not been screened within the last five years. But more surprising is about a third or a quarter of the women that did have invasive cervical carcinoma had been screened in the last five years and had a normal cytology result. In addition, as part of the US PSTF uh, literature review and before making their recommendations in 2012, uh, they performed an analysis looking at the variable sensitivity of cytology and also the sensitivity of HPV DNA testing. What they found was that on average, HPV DNA testing actually increased the sensitivity for high-grade disease by about 36% over the sensitivity of cytology. Another limitation to cytology and cytology-based screening is that it does not establish risk. What cytology is extremely good at is actually identifying cervical cancer or cervical cancer precursors at the time of, um, or at the time of uh, inspection or analysis, but it doesn't establish whether or not a woman will develop these lesions or these high grade or this high grade disease within the upcoming screening interval. We know that HPV is the necessary cause of cervical cancer. And in fact, about 70% of all cervical cancers are actually associated with only two genotypes. And these are HPV 16 and 18. In addition, what we know is that um, by testing for HPV, and especially genotyping 16 and 18, we're also able to uh, identify women at risk for developing high-grade disease. 
This is a study done out of Kaiser following about 20,000 women with varying cytology grades for about a 10 year period. What they saw was depending on the HPV status at baseline, uh, women were, were actually stratified by varying risk. So that women with an HPV 16 positive result were actually at a very high risk of developing a CIM3 or greater lesion within this 10 year period. And this was even noted that at the, the oops, my arrow got a little short, that even within about a year from the initial HPV 16 positive results, uh, close to 10% of women actually had a high grade lesion. This was slightly lower or, uh, for HPV 18, but again, towards the end of the 10 year study, you saw that the risk between the two were actually much higher than the risk associated with any other of the uh, 12, or with the other 12 high risk HPV genotypes. Additionally, when a woman tested HPV negative at baseline, regardless of the cytology results, the risk of developing a high grade lesion was extremely low, reaching less than 1% over the, one, uh, the 10 year period. In addition to these, cytology-based screening is highly complex, especially when combined with an HPV result. Cytology has several varying grades, including the NILM, ASCIS, ELSO, and HSO, but there's also atypical squamous cells cannot exclude HSO, several types of glandular abnormalities, and three categories to describe specimen quality. And due to this complexity, clinicians have about 12 different management algorithms just to manage cytology results. And when combined with an HPV result, you can see by these various diagrams that the algorithms themselves are highly complex. And they're actually so complex that clinicians who don't specialize in cervical disease are finding them difficult to use. And in fact, navigating these does require having cheat sheets, slide rules, and even smartphone apps. So within the last month or so, the FDA approved the first HPV test to be used as a first line primary screening for cervical cancer. The aim of this is to not only uh, limit reduce some of the limitations associated with cytology-based screening, but also to simplify overall screening and management practices. The COBOS HPV test um, has an additional intended use. Um, and so this is the intended use statement uh, as that was, that's in the package insert for the COBOS test. And basically just to summarize or provide a high level of the intended use statement. It is approved for women 25 years and older to be used as a first line primary cervical cancer screening test to detect high risk HPV, including genotyping for 16 and 18. As part of this approval, um, or it was approved with an algorithm in mind. And although the guidance documents and guideline updates are pending, HPV primary screening may simplify screening and also enhance current screening practices relying on cytology. So with this algorithm for primary screening, the most sensitive test is used first, which is the HPV test to identify women at risk of underlying high-grade disease. HPV testing also removes the subjectivity of screening and produce, providing greater reproducibility and less uh, variability in positive calls. And with a three in one testing design of the COBOS HPV test, women are immediately stratified uh, based on risk of having or developing high grade disease within the screening interval. So the algorithm that was approved by the FDA um, 
is, is listed right here. And just to kind of walk you through it, uh, women testing HPV negative are followed up uh, with appropriate methods and screening intervals. Uh, those testing HPV 16 or 18 positive, um, so these women would be at the highest risk of high-grade disease, would be referred for immediate colposcopy. And those women positive for the 12 other high-risk HPV uh, genotypes, but which are eight, who are HPV 16 or 18 negative, would be tri triaged with cytology to determine the presence of an underlying high-grade disease. Those are abnormal cytology results would be referred to colposcopy. Um, and those with uh, negative cytology would also be followed up in an appropriate screening uh, interval. So with this algorithm, there's an integrated balance between sensitivity offered by the, by the HPV test and also specificity uh, with the integrated 16 and 18 genotyping and also the triage utilizing cytology for, for the other high-risk HPV positive results. So that not every woman testing HPV positive would be referred to for immediate colposcopy, but really only the right women at the highest risk would be. So the first question that really came to mind when, when discussing the primary screening algorithm and primary screening in general is at what age should this screening uh, begin? We know that HPV infections are very common in younger women um, and they also tend to be much more transient. However, what we also see is that there is a high burden of CIN3 in women 25 to 29 and that cytology does perform poorly, specifically in young women as opposed to older women. And what we also need to remember that the point or the main objective of cervical cancer screening is to prevent cervical cancer in the first place. Here is a a data set from the SEER tumor registry looking at the invasive cervical cancer rates in the US. What we can see is that starting at about age 25, the incidence of cervical cancer um, dramatically increases to a peak at around 35 to 39. Ideally, what we want to do is identify the cervical cancer precursors before they lead to cervical cancer, which means that we should probably start looking for precancer in the age group 25 to 29 to prevent this rise in cervical cancer incidence. But we also need to establish what the burden of disease is in this younger age group. If these younger, this young population has very little disease, screening all of these women would be uh, fruitless, as we would just be sending a tremendous number of women to colposcopy without much benefit in detecting uh, disease. Here is the data from Athena. It is looking at the all CIN3 or greater lesions detected. Um, and it's distri distributed by age. What we see in that for women 25 and old or older, about a third of all CIN3 cases detected in Athena were found in women 25 to 29. And in fact, the proportion of this or, or the number of these CIN3 were much higher. So a third of the disease was found in about 6,600 women aged 25 to 29 versus all the disease found in women 40 and older, um, which was about 22,000 women. So this represents about a four and a half fold higher disease burden in the younger age group than the older. And additionally, given the small number of women or the relatively small number of women, 25 to 29, uh, compared to all other age groups, 
the proportion of CI in threes was actually the highest in this age group than any other age group. And lastly, when evaluating at what age to begin screening, we must evaluate the current screening practices. And for women 25 to 29, this is cytology alone. Um, and we also have to establish whether they are adequately, or this uh, standard of care is adequate, adequately detecting disease within this age group. In Athena, about 57% uh, percent of women 25 to 29 with CI in three or greater had a negative cytology result. And this is much higher than what was seen in any other age group. This suggests that the current cytology-based screening is ineffective in detecting precancer in women 25 to 29. So at this point, we've established that current screening practices have their limitations and also have highlighted the need to improve screening in women 25 to 29. Based on the size and scope of the landmark Athena trial, we're able to compare various screening app strategies and evaluate the performance of the COBOX HPV test when used as a first line primary screening test. So the data I'm about to present was presented to the FDA Microbiology Devices Advisor Committee on March 12, 2014, uh, leading to the FDA approval. And during this meeting, the panel voted 39 to 0 in favor um, in favor on three general measures. One was the safety of the primary screening algorithm, uh, e efficacy, and also the fact the benefits would outweigh the harm, um, especially compared to the cytology-based screening program. So what we'll be talking about um, predominantly is looking at the uh, sensitivity and specificity of the primary screening algorithm. We'll be looking at the predictive values, positive predictive and negative predictive values um, as measures of effectiveness. What we'll also be talking about is the safety. Um, again, this can be measured by the, the negative predictive value, but also looking at the three-year cumulative incidence risk for a negative result. Um, because it, most importantly, when relying on HPV testing or a new screening algorithm, we need to establish safety of a negative result. In all these data, we'll be using CI in three as the endpoint. Um, because it really is the best surrogate for cancer since it is uh, the immediate precur precursor to cervical cancer. Um, it also has a very low likelihood of regression. And really, it's, it's a disease stage which is almost always treated. So to talk about the fit, um, effectiveness of the primary screening algorithm. We'll be talking about mainly the, um, the baseline Athena study um, and about the 41,000 women that were 25 years and older um, in, in the Athena study. Um, of those, about 8,000 women were triaged to colposcopy at this baseline phase. Uh, the main comparator in all these data sets is cytology alone. Uh, basically, women who test negative would be referred back to routine screening, while those with ASCUS or greater would be referred to colposcopy. Uh, this is the primary screening algorithm. Um, I'm not going to walk you through these things in great detail at, at this point, but essentially it does uh, include a uh, triage of 12 other high-risk HPV positive results with, with cytology and HPV 16 and 18 um, as part of the initial uh, triage for colposcopy. So the COBOS test design, um, it has a three-in-one function. So basically it has an integrated uh, 16 and 18 genotyping. 
So women are immediately either given a result for the 12 other high-risk HPV genotypes as a pooled result, as well as an individual result for 16 and an individual result for HPV 18. Um, and also uh, beta globin is used as an internal cellular control just to ensure that there's uh, there's actually cellular material in the collection and the sample itself. So when comparing the HPV primary screening, what we see is that uh, when compared to cytology, HPV primary screening increases the sensitivity by about 37%. And it also maintains uh, the same relative specificity. This is because we're using the HPV test as in the initial test, which elevates the sensitivity. But with this, this particular algorithm, uh, what we're able to do is also offer high level of specificity. And then we see for the detection of CIN3 or greater, the positive predictive value of the HPV primary screening strategy is about 12%, which is nearly twice that of cytology alone. And this indicates an improved measure of effectiveness um, as, as women testing positive are more likely to have disease. The negative predictive value is also improved with an HPV primary screening strategy compared to cytology, um, which indicates a higher measure of safety as women who test negative with the strategy can be given more reassurance that they don't have high grade disease than women who test negative with cytology. Another comparator that we'll use is the co-testing hybrid. And so this is a little bit complex because what it does is breaks down the screening scenarios based on age. And this is um, in line with current guidelines. Uh, so women 25 to 29 are utilize a cytology-based screening, um, but also has, have an ASCIS uh, triage in which women with ASCIS cytology um, are sent for an HPV test, and only if they are HPV positive will they be referred to uh, colposcopy. For women 30 years and older, in the latest cervical cancer screening guidelines, um, HPV and cytology co-testing was the preferred method of cervical cancer screening. Again, this is only for women 30 years and older. In this scenario, both the HPV test and the cytology dictate what the management and follow-up strategy should be. So when we compare uh, HPV primary screening with this co-testing hybrid that incorporates genotyping, uh, what we see is that this obviously does increase the sensitivity over cytology alone, but HPV primary screening maintains a higher level of sensitivity for the detection of CIN3 or greater. This is predominantly due to the fact that the co-testing hybrid seen here um, has the benefit of HPV testing only for women 30 years and older. So women 25 to 29 are still uh, screened with cytology alone or cytology-based screening, um, which really reduces the overall sensitivity of this particular algorithm. When we look at the positive predictive values and the negative predictive values, again, we see that the co-testing hybrid with genotyping does increase the positive predictive value over cytology alone. But again, the HPV primary screen um, still maintains the highest positive predictive value as well as the negative predictive value. Um, so again, the screening with the, with the HPV primary screening uh, would result in improved safety and effectiveness 
effectiveness over the existing guideline supported strategy. So let's look at the clinical utility of each strategy. And this really puts the performance of each into perspective. To fully assess each of these algorithms, we really must demonstrate a balance between benefits and harms. Benefits relating to the number of high grade disease detected and harms by the surrogate marker of the number of colposcopies performed. And the efficiency of the algorithms are further established based on the number of tests or procedures needed to be performed per CI in three or greater case detected. So for the 40,944 women, 25 and older included in the Athena study, an equal number of initial tests will be needed to be performed if using a cytology only strategy. By comparison, the primary screening algorithm requires slightly more first line uh, screening tests. And this is mainly due to the cytology triage of non HPV 16 and 18 positive high risk HPV results. Um, but overall, it offers a lower ratio of test to disease, about 190 versus 240 for cytology alone. In addition, the primary screening algorithm yields a lower number of overall colposcopies that need to be performed. And because the primary screening algorithm demonstrates a higher sensitivity by detecting an increased number of CIN3 or greater cases, it also results in nearly half, it also results in nearly half the number of colposcopies needed to be performed per CIN3 or greater case detected, which demonstrates a greater uh, screening efficiency. In comparison uh, with the co-testing hybrid, so keep in mind it is uh, broken down by age, where women 25 to 29 receive an active triage screening algorithm, and those 30 years and older are tested uh, with or co-tested with cytology and HPV, um, what we see is there's the initial number of screening tests nearly doubled. Um, and keep in mind for both this algorithm and the HPV primer screening one uh, that we just spoke about before, the HPV genotyping is actually integrated into the initial HPV result. Um, so that reflex cytology would, or reflex genotyping would elevate the, the number of screening tests um, some significantly depending on what the um, reflex algorithm uh, chosen. And compared to, cyto compared to primary screening, the number of colposcopies that detect each CI in three or greater case also increases raising the overall uh, number of colposcopies needed to be performed per CI in three or greater. And in the end, because we're still relying on cytology-based screening for women 25 to 29, the sensitivity of the co-testing hybrid is inferior to primary screening algorithm since only 211 cases of CI in three or greater were actually detected. So with these data, uh, the baseline effectiveness of the primary screening algorithm um, is, is well demonstrated. But to further assess the effectiveness of risk stratification and the safety of the primary screening algorithm following the negative COBOS HPV test results, data from the three-year follow-up phase is used. Those who did not reach the study endpoint of CIN2 or greater at baseline were invited to participate in the follow-up phase of the study. And during this follow-up, women were seen annually and had both a cytology and an HPV test performed. Uh, if they had an abnormal cytology result, they received a colposcopy. And women that had a CIN2 or greater lesion at those follow-up visits 
uh, exited this study for treatment. Um, at year three, all women remain, remaining in the study were offered an exit colposcopy. So HPV testing detects a risk factor for cervical cancer and risk stratification should really accurately predict long-term risk of high-grade disease beyond a single baseline measure. It's well established that women testing HPV 16 and or 18 are at an elevated risk of having an underlying precancerous lesion at the time of testing. But further, the infections with HPV 16 and 18 also predict an elevated long-term risk of developing high-grade disease well within a three to five year period. And risk stratifies women with HPV positive results by, by 16 and 18 genotyping uh, offers an algorithm uh, that allows clinic, clinicians to leverage the high sensitivity of HPV DNA testing while avoiding unnecessary follow-up by pooled HPV testing. So within the pooled HPV positive group that had about a 10% risk, we find both women at an extremely high risk of CIN3 with HPV 16 or HPV 18 positive results, as well as women who had a significantly lower risk at about 5% uh, when testing uh, positive for the other 12 high-risk HPV genotypes. And in fact, in the overall population of women 25 years and older, one in four women that tested HPV 16 at baseline developed high-grade disease within a three-year screening interval or within a three-year interval. And one in nine women, uh, HPV 18, developed CIN3, which was much higher than the 10% of women positive for the pooled high-risk HPV results at the three-year mark. And it should also be noted that there's, there was a very low risk of CIN3 or greater over the three-year interval for women testing a, uh, COBOS HPV negative at baseline. Um, and this data uh, really demonstrate that the baseline COBOS HPV results can successfully predict risk for high-grade disease over the, the interval. But the most critical piece of data uh, is the significance of the test results in about the 90% of women in a screening population who will actually test negative. And negative screening results should provide sufficient reassurance that a woman is at a low risk of having an underlying precancerous lesion and then a high-grade disease will not develop within the next screening interval. The risk of being diagnosed with CIN3 or greater over a three-year period for a woman with a negative COBOS HPV test result in the green line is one half the risk predicted by negative cytology results, which is here in gray. Clearly, the lower risk associated with a negative COBOS HPV test result provides greater reassurance uh, to both the patient and the clinician that disease will not be diagnosed over the next three years. And this lower risk for developing CIN3 or greater really confirms the safety of a negative COBOS HPV test and the safety of the use of the COBOS HPV test as a frontline primary screening uh, out as part of a front as a frontline primary screening test as part of a primary screening algorithm. And so again, primary screening um, is really uh, based on, on three main factors. What we want to do is ensure that the 90% of the screening population um, has, or assure that the 90% of women um, who test screen negative are at a minimal risk of progressing or having a high-grade disease over the screening interval. 
but to also provide the other 10% with appropriate risk stratification for action and also identify those women at the highest risk for immediate uh, follow-up and potential treatment and management. So uh, the FINA data confirms that high-risk HPV testing with HPV 16 and 18 genome testing is superior to cytology for first-line primary screening of cervical cancer in both negative predictive value and detecting cervical disease. The COBOS or the primary screening algorithm utilizing the COBOS HPV test really leverages the high sensitivity of HPV DNA testing, the built-in risk stratification of HPV 16 and 18 genotyping, and also the triage of the high speci triage with high specificity of cytology for an optimal balance of cervical uh, optimal balance of sensitivity and specificity in cervical cancer screening. It provides a high reassurance that women with a negative HPV DNA result will remain disease-free over the three, oh, for three years. It identifies the women positive for HPV 16 and 18 who are at the highest risk of having an underlying cervical precancer. And it also utilizes cytology triage of the 12 other high-risk HPV positives to maintain a high, uh, high degree of screening efficiency. And uh, the COBOS HPV test is the only FDA-approved option to improve the disease detection in women age 25 to 29. So with that, um, I will answer any questions. I don't see any questions that popped in um, yet. Um, feel free if there are any questions on any of the anything I've presented in, in this uh, presentation, or um, if you have any other general questions, I'd be happy to answer that. But um, I thank you all for attending and uh, watching this. Um, and again, I believe that there are, um, my con you have my contact information, so if there's any additional questions that come outside of this partic uh, particular session, um, I would be more than happy to address those. Uh, <laughs> so with that, um, have a great rest of the day, and again, thank you for joining and, and tuning in. All right. Oh, I just got a question. So I'll answer that really quickly. Um, so the question was, um, what is the platform of these tests? So all the data presented here was based on the COBOT HPV test by Roche. Um, so the data was from the Athena clinical trial that consisted of actually over 47,000 women. Um, but most of the data were presented for those women 25 and older, uh, for which was, which was really the general population that was included in the study, and that was about 41,000 women. But it's the COBOS HPV test. All right, thank you again. Oh, uh, one last question. The instrument is the, the COBOS 4800 system um, by Roche. All right, thank you.